you, John. It was great to relive some of those years. <laughs> uh, I don't know about uh, Alan or Ann, but I discovered that when you find out you're getting an award for integrity, every dumb thing you've ever said or done <laughs> passes before your eyes. So I'm deeply humbled by this recognition. Uh, I was just an, ins an ins aspiring writer who took a 33-year detour through public relations without any real preparation. Uh, as an undergrad, I majored in philosophy. In grad school, I studied broadcasting, both degrees at the polar extremes of a liberal arts education. But I had the good fortune to have learned the art and science of public relations from the likes of Ed Block, Marilyn Lurie, and literally dozens of other AT&T people whose names you probably never heard. What they had in common was that they had internalized a set of standards laid down by Arthur W. Page over the 20 years that he ran AT&T Public Relations. It wasn't a complicated canon. Our job was to explain the company to the public and to explain the public to the company, which Page called the intangible but more important job. We were to do both with as much candor and clarity as we could muster. But we were always to remember that what the company did said a lot more about its character than what it said. Now, of course, Page worked in a very different almost leisurely world than we do. But the principles he espoused may be even more important today. Public communications, it seems to me, is at a dangerous tipping point. As Alan suggested, the internet democratized media, making everyone a publisher, from the proverbial 400-pound loner sitting on his mother's couch to ideologues of every religious, political, social, and fabulous stripe. Original reporting and writing are still done largely by the same pre-internet news organizations, but those organizations are fewer, smaller, and poorer. Digital media have siphoned off their advertising dollars, but more significantly, they've cheapened the value of content, turning it into a commodity measured in clicks rather than in substance. Truth is no longer determined by conformity to proven facts, but how, by, by how well it meshes with pre-existing feelings. Fact-checking is attacked as whining and nitpicking, and ultimately reinforces the very attitudes on which fake news feeds. Now, I don't mean to be dystopian, and it's not exactly news that the public, on a good day, is at best skeptical of public relations people. But now Gallup tells us that Americans' trust in journalists is at an all-time low. Fully two-thirds of U.S. adults don't believe the news they see, hear, or read. And it's especially frightening when the most powerful man in the world attacks reporters as the most dishonest people in the world and calls some of our leading news organizations enemies of the American people. We in public relations may have other ways to reach stakeholders, but if the credibility of the media is undermined, we all lose because there will be no check on the people who write the laws under which we operate and on the people who implement those laws. Fake news may be aimed at political opponents today, but tomorrow it could very well be just as easily targeted at companies, brands, and civil society itself, poisoning the markets in which we compete. I don't think the public relations industry can stand by and just hope that this situation will change. Media literacy may be the social issue of our time. Addressing it is in our industry's own interest. 
For starters, no professional PR practitioner should create or enable fake news in a misguided attempt to attract attention, as one entertainment company recently did, nor should we hide behind phony groups and campaigns, as too many of us still do. Just getting control over that may help limit the supply of fake news. But public relations, I think, has a role in addressing the demand side also. Understanding human decision-making and behavior is in our wheelhouse. Few industries are better equipped to share that understanding with consumers in a way that makes them more sensitive to cognitive illusions like confirmation bias, tribalism, and implicit prejudice. The advertising industry has a mechanism for responding to social issues. It's called the Ad Council, and for more than 75 years, it's created ad campaigns to fight everything from forest fires and racial discrimination to drug addiction and obesity, all created by volunteer agencies and run in donated media. Why doesn't the public relations industry have an equivalent effort? Individual PR agencies and client organizations devote hours to pro bono work on behalf of many causes. But shouldn't we be organized in a coordinated network of PR agencies and clients, addressing a cause at the heart of what we're about, teaching people how to be savvy media consumers? We could use our skills to teach people how to fact check emails, tweets, and Facebook postings, how to respond to racist, homophobic, or hateful email and social media posts, how pictures and statistics can lie. We could teach them how to fight the spread of hateful propaganda, whether from a neo-Nazi in his parents' basement or a member of ISIS on a laptop in Syria. But it won't happen by itself. It'll take the combined efforts of clients, agencies, and media. The result could be better informed consumers and a public relations industry demonstrating its true worth to society. Arthur Page famously said, all business exists by public approval. But he wouldn't want that approval to hinge on less than a well-informed public free from psychological coercion. Neither would Arthur Page's successors, like Larry Foster, and neither should we. Thank you very much for this honor.